Today we continue with our build up to the minority political parties and independent candidates election debate as we count down to December 7. In 24 hours, the Imani Center for Policy and Education and your election headquarters bring to you the minority political parties and independent candidate election debate. Our guest today is Mari Kofigan, another independent candidate who is confident of beating both the NDC and the MPP come December 7. Let's get to know him better. Um, so, Mr. Gan, first of all, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, you are um, the first candidate in this election to release the manifesto. I, I believe so. Yes, yes. And so, as far as messaging goes, mm. there's a lot that you've developed. Yes. Um, so, I, I want us to go straight to the question of your alternative mm. um, in terms of governance. What's the broad idea you're looking at? The broad idea is to build a country that works for every Ghanaian, not a few. That largely is the broader idea. Under that, we want to have a government that respects values, um, that is very big on ensuring that the systems do work, uh, in other words, the institutions and all that do work. Um, but one which also is bound on accountability uh, and, and, and some level of creativity. Uh, we've, we've been playing around the same um, sort of governance system for so long. Whether it's delivering the quality we want, uh, I think we are all uh, sure now that it isn't. And so ours is to build a government that ensures that one, every Ghanaian gets involved, every Ghanaian benefits from the state. Um, in terms of leadership, but also that, you know, we build a country that we can be sure that will take us into the future. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest issues, and we have been discussing this throughout the week with all the candidates who come, mm -hmm. is we look at the issues that are facing us today right. and explore the alternatives that we have. Right. We have seen that the sanitation minister has said we are 85% through in making Accra the cleanest city mm. in Africa. Where do you stand on this? What do you think should be the solution? I, 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 I don't think she's got it right. I, I don't know what the basis is. I mean, we, we all live in Accra. We, we've seen what is still happening in Accra. Um, we've got landfill sites that are choked, uh, and so they're spilling over uh, everywhere else. Uh, and so 85%, I, I don't know where she's gotten that number for, but that is way far from what the reality is. I mean, I put that on my wall uh, a day or so ago, uh, and the comments are just laughable, you know, for a government minister to make that assessment. It's almost as though she does not live in Accra. Um, I mean, we've said we have alternatives to this. Uh, one of the biggest alternatives we have is to ensure that we do put together another uh, processing plant for city waste. Um, that is likely to uh, manage city waste by another 90% so that the landfill sites can you know, start shutting down because they haven't helped and they aren't helping. Uh, and it's crucial that we reduce the number of landfill sites we have because, because of the diseases that we're getting out of that. Um, so that's one of the key things we want to do. We, we also have a bigger plan for uh, uh, drainages, uh, integrated drainages, not you know, build a gutter here, build a gutter there, not that kind of drainage. We, we have said that in our first year of office, we want to have an integrated plan um, for at least Accra and Kumasi in respect of the drainage system that must exist. And this is going to be led by the engineers of this country. Um, and then from year two and three, we should be getting fund funding to support uh, the building of this uh, <clears throat> drainage. So there is, there is quite a, a lot of thought that has gone into solving the sanitation problem. The, the challenge with sanitation is that the heart of it um, has been described as attitudinal. And in our Clinic Ghana campaign, we have visited the, some of the most challenged communities here in Accra, for mm. instance, your Chocos and your Nimas and what have you. Mm. And we find that there's a large part of this that has to do with the people not understanding what waste disposal is, what waste sorting is. Right. How are you going to tackle this? Well, I mean, we, we often talk about, like you're saying, we often talk about attitudes. Uh, there's, there's largely one way in this country that we have been successful as treat, at treating or, you know, uh, shaping attitudes. It's enforcing the law. Unfortunately, that hasn't really happened in the last couple of, uh, uh, you know, uh, governments we've, we've had. Um, we have said one of the critical things we would also do is to ensure that laws are enforced without fear or favor. 
it is in enforcing these laws and making sure that people are punished for what is not right, then they learn that it cannot be done this way. Um, but if people do things and they don't get punished, the next day they're going to do it again. The next day somebody else who realizes that they haven't been punished is also going to join them and do it again. So um, uh, one of our biggest agendas in not just sanitation but even road traffic and the rest is ensuring that we punish offenders. And for me, I have said even in the manifesto that we're going to make quite a lot of money from, from indiscipline. We're going to monetize indiscipline in this country. So you're, you're suggesting punishments being monetary uh, Not necessarily monetary. It could take many forms. I'm asking um, because you said you're going to monetize it. Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if it does involve money, then it does involve money because people must begin to feel, you know, the pinch somewhere. Uh, once they start to feel the pinch somewhere, and one of the ways to feel the pinch is economical. So, uh, yes, we are not oversighting the use of money as, as a pinch board. Uh, we will use that where, where it is necessary. The legislative change you require to make something like this, it means you'd have to really build consensus ab across both political parties. Political parties which you do mm. not subscribe to, political parties which, if you are successful, would have lost in the election. Mm. How do you build those bridges? Oh, uh, you see, I, I think this is, a, this is a debate that uh, keeps coming up. Uh, I, I think what we've, um, we've ended up assuming most of the time is that the fact that, you know, parliamentarians are not in government means that they, all, they don't want something good for this country. They do want something good for this country. Uh, and it is up to us to show both the Ghanaian people and the parliamentarians that, look, this is what we intend to do for this country. At that point... It becomes their justification to the Ghanaian people why they will not, you know, uh, uh, follow through with a plan that the Ghanaians themselves know that is going to be for their good. Um, so we want to have the difficult conversations. Uh, uh, Daniel, you and I know in the last couple of years, at least in the last 27 years, uh, we've not really had uh, a, sorry, uh, a legislature that is a check on the executive. Largely, the legislatures have been a rubber stamp. Of, of the executive. Having an independent candidate in executive office means that some hard decisions are going to be made, some hard conversations are going to now be made. Um, and we are not afraid to make those hard conversations. At the end of the day, the MP on the other side and, and the executive on this side should be able to say, you know what, we agree that this is something that is good and all for Ghana. Uh, and, and the joy of it is that, look, if, if, that, if that MP has something good happening in their constituency, he stands a more a better chance of getting re-elected again if he if he, mm. if he shows that he supported it. Um, another issue that we, we dealt with earlier today, mm. the new electoral rules still has minors and foreigners. The EC chairperson, Madam Jean Mensah, made mention of that. What do you make of this issue and how far this, this case has traveled? Uh, you know what, Daniel, I, I, this, this whole uh, every four years election uh, uh, role thing, for me, it's a real pain. It's, it's something that is insulting to our intelligence. I think we should have gone past this stage way by now. We're 63 years old as a country, uh, and we still can have, what I want to see is one centralized database of, of citizen ID. Uh, a citizen ID that is fed in by the various institutions. Let the birth and registry be the only institution in this country that can amend the health, uh, sorry, the birth section of that registry. Let the police be the only uh, institution in this country that can make entries uh, regarding criminal, you know, uh, uh, issues. Let the judiciary be the only, in, you know, institution that can make uh, 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 inputs on, on, on judgments that have been passed against you. So we have one systemic, centralized, you know, database that we don't have to do this four years, four years to look. We spent over 200 mil uh, just doing this. Next four years, I pray this is not the case because next four years, I want to see this stop. We can't be spending this amount of money when we could have actually used the same amount of money to do something very tangible, very concrete. Um, so that, you know, you just have one card and you know that it takes care of everything in this country. You don't uh, think that the Electoral Commission should make a decision on their own as an independent institution? Well, th there's no problem with the, with the institution, sorry, the EC making a decision of their Which own. Which is what they did. Th th there's no problem with that. There are two issues we're dealing with here. The EC making a decision based on who has an identity as a Ghanaian. What we are saying is that let's have one centralized unit that that ensures 
that you know every institution in this country accepts that as the one proof of identity okay. So that, you know, the EC just has to say, okay, let's go into that database. Let's pull all those who are above 18 years uh, and, and beyond uh, this year. And mind you, as we have said, the hospitals are going to be responsible for things like removing people's name out because they have died. Once you have been labeled as dead, your, 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 your details fall flat. But we have a country where access to health care is a challenge. So if you're going to depend on hospitals in the first place, that mm. is problematic. No, actually, this is going to help health care. Because one of the biggest problems we have in healthcare is data. Kwame, uh, sorry, uh, Daniel, if you move to Ketekrachi, for example, you are probably going to be told to go back to your hospital and get your file and bring it. After My 63 years. The question is about the number of people living in rural Ghana mm -hmm. who are born at home mm -hmm. and who are born in places without adequate healthcare personnel. But then we need and to. And so shape having, that. having that challenge means we, we, we can't we, rely on a system no, like that for healthcare delivery. No, we can't. Everything does have a solution. I get what you're saying that, you know, uh, people are born out, and it does happen. You know, uh, my cousins, most of them were born at home. But if we are do so in the healthcare, for example, if we are actually doing primary healthcare and, and community healthcare, for example, and we used to have that in our days, you, you have nurses in the brown uh, dress coming around, making sure all the children in the house had uh, the uh, whatever they put in their mouth so that vaccinations or something of this right. Yeah. This is community healthcare. Why did that stop? It didn't cost us extra. Why did that stop? We've been spending, what, over $2 billion every single year on health, and we can't get basic registration of beds right? Then we do have a problem, Daniel. So where, what is, so, so you feel the solution is getting healthcare professionals who at the moment, it's difficult to pay them because we, we have healthcare professionals at home that we can't absorb into the system mm. to go to the homes of people to register them. Well, I mean, the, the proportion of it, we, we need to look at the numbers. The, I, I'm not sure what the proportions of people who have been born at home is, uh, and we do need to be sure about that number. But what I am saying is that whether you, you focus as a government on primary health care or whether you focus as a government on secondary health care, you are still going to have some element of what uh, 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 community health care just because of the way our society is, mm. is, is, is structured. Mm. There's quite a huge number of people in the rural areas who cannot make it to the hospital. Even mm -hmm. though there are hospitals in those regions, we should be able to reach them. They are Ghanaians too. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so um, we need to know what the numbers are in terms of you know, how many people are being born at home. But whatever the case is, that Daniel, Nobody should be born in this country and not have a certificate to show for it. That is just the most basic form of, of, of administration, right. health-wise. Finally, um, Mark, finally, how are you going to win an election which requires you to get the north of 4 million votes in the country, majority of which are going to be from rural populations? Mm. How are you going to do that? You, you, you doubt if I can? I'm asking you how you're going okay. to. I mean, we're running an election. Uh, sorry, we're running a campaign. Um, I am already out there. We've got people on the ground who are out there. Uh, most people see us uh, and they feel that you know we're, we're just in Accra. It's not the case. Uh, we've got you know hundreds, probably thousands of people mm -hmm. in the regions who are going you know on the ground, talking to their families, talking to their friends, putting up posters. There is work being done. How many volunteers do you have across the country? Oh, I couldn't even begin to count. Um, we've Give me got, a ballpark figure. Well, we've got, what I can tell you is that we've got about four layers of teams. Um, we've got uh, what we call the, uh, the operational team, which is responsible for ensuring that the day-to-day -day things happen, you know, people are being communicated to what we are saying today, everybody gets to hear it, uh, and that I'm here today. Um, now, that is in a ballpark of about 30 of us, 30. Then you have the thematic team, which is you know, a team that is responsible. So our manifesto, for example, there's a team responsible for health, there's a team responsible for infrastructure and all that. About 10, of, 10 people in each of those teams. So we're talking about another 100. Some of them are here, some of them work in Africa, some of them work outside the country. Uh, but we are able to work in that sort of dynamic space, not necessarily you have to be here. We've, we've, we've evolved. Um, and then, of course, then you have the regional teams that are you know, and um, that's where my interest is. Mm. Those on the ground knocking on doors and telling right. people about my week. Those numbers are growing every day. I, I start getting calls from 5 a.m. every day. 
I hold one of the the team phones. The so it's the, we have phones. So can you give me a number? Uh, you know, on a regional level, I can tell you we've got nothing less than a thousand, at least that we at know. Least that a thousand people across a, a the country. A thousand people that we know are coordinating directly with the operational team. Mobilizing four million. They're going to do more than that. Like mm -hmm. I said, people are coming on board every single How day. How are you resourcing your team? We're resourcing by, you know, Ghanaians are paying for all of this. Since How? I started this announcement, since I made the announcement in 2019, every single thing we have done has been paid for by the ordinary Ghanaian. So how much have you spent so far? I, we haven't collated everything yet. So I can tell you for a fact that if something needs to be get, get, get done today, uh, we just put word out. Somebody will probably call. And this is the reason why we can't give you a ballpark figure is because we can say, you know what, we need to shoot a couple of videos. We put it mm -hmm. out there on the platforms. Somebody might come up and say, oh, I have a studio in here. Just go in there. I've told my guys they will deal with it. Okay. Uh, you can't put a number on that because, you know, we don't know how much he's paying his boys or his team. And therefore, you know, uh, we, we get support from everywhere. Mark Kofi Gan, thank you very much thank for you. joining us this afternoon on The Pulse. My next guest is also an um, independent presidential candidate. His name is Samuel Oforian Pofo. He joins us shortly after this. But let me just say that, um, yes, so biomedcentral.com is where I just did a rudimentary check. 75% of raw maternal deaths in Ghana are due to unskilled um, births, unskilled okay. and unsupervised births. Even in right. urban centers, 20% mm. of the deaths, 20% of all births mm. are, are, are not supervised by skilled birth attendants. Okay. So that should give so you So we do have a majority that are supervised. In urban areas, yes. in rural areas, to 75. Our population is not that urbanized. Thanks, Mario.